I've been a full-time editor since 2004, and I've learned a lot of lessons in all those years. In this video, I want to share the most important lesson I learned and all the ways I use it when I'm working in DaVinci Resolve. Now, I didn't learn this lesson in an edit suite. I actually learned it in an A-level art class when I was 17. I was beginning to paint a still life that the teacher had set up. I sketched out the main building blocks with a pencil, and then I got my paints out and started painting one of the objects in the middle of the canvas. I worked on it for a while, but the colors just weren't looking right, and I couldn't put my finger on why. So I called my teacher over and asked if she could help me out. She took my paints, mixed a kind of beige gray color, and proceeded to paint all over the small section I'd been working on. Then she gave me my paints back and said, fill the canvas with color. I'll give you 15 minutes. Now I couldn't believe it, and trying my hardest not to swear, I asked her, why would you do that? Because you don't have the context, she said. That color you see in real life looks the way it does because of all the other colors around it. It will look dark if the things around it are light. It will look dull if the things around it look saturated. You might have seen this optical illusion before. The square labeled A looks darker than the one labeled B, but they're in fact the same brightness. Well, let's take a look at this image. The circles are made up of four quadrants of four colors until you zoom in, and then you see they're all the same color, but colored lines running through are changing your perception. So this idea of seeing things in context, looking at the bigger picture, macro versus micro, however you want to define it, is one of the most important skills you need to develop as an editor. Now I'll show you some of the different ways I implement that skill when I'm working in DaVinci Resolve. You see, a massive amount of my time is spent making what we call customer stories. These are mini documentaries where instead of telling the story of our client, we tell the story of their customers and how our client helped them to achieve their goals. That means the vast majority of these videos are based around interviews. But before you start deciding what parts you're going to include in your video, you need to speak to your director, your producer, whoever you're working with, and get a good idea of what story you're trying to tell. For every video we make, we sit down with a client and put together a creative brief where we ask a ton of questions. What's the main goal of the video? What problem does your customer have? How does your product help them? We'll ask them about the tone and the style they're going for, and a ton more questions I don't have time to get into right now. If that's the sort of thing you want to learn more about, let me know in the comments. Oh, and side note, if you didn't know, there's a built-in text document in Resolve called Project Notes. It's super basic and doesn't have any formatting options, but once you have your brief, you can paste it in there and save yourself from having to jump out of Resolve to a PDF or a browser every time you want to look at it. You can assign a keyboard shortcut to it as well, so you can open and close it at will. Now, as you watch these interviews, for every line you're pulling out, remember that it doesn't matter if it's a really great line on its own. When you watch it, is it helping you tell the story you're trying to tell? And I use that word watch on purpose. In Resolve Studio, we have the ability to transcribe videos and then make edits by selecting lines of text. At Visual Aid, we also use a service called Reduct, so we can send interviews to clients and they can highlight the parts they really want. We can then add those highlights to something called a reel and then export that as an XML file, and then we can import it into Resolve. Working with transcriptions has absolutely changed the way we work, but there's one big thing that people often skip. Just because it reads well as a piece of text, it doesn't mean it's a good quote. You need to see and hear it in the context of the actual interview. Did they mispronounce something? Are there a bunch of stumbles and ums and ahs that the transcription left out? Now, I've definitely had clients send me a list of quotes on Redux, and they clearly haven't bothered to watch the interview, even though it's right there in the corner. Also, it's not unusual for one of these videos to have two, three, four, five interviews, even for something that's only supposed to be three minutes long. One thing I like to do is assign a clip color to each person. Then when I'm making what we call a radio edit, where I'm not thinking about the B-roll yet, I'm just trying to nail the narrative, I can zoom out and quickly see, oh, this person is featured way more than anyone else. Well, this person only shows up in one spot while everyone else is spread out throughout the video. Maybe that's intentional, maybe not, but having that kind of bird's eye view helps me keep track of the decisions I've made. When I am working with B-roll, the first thing I do is dump it on a timeline, watch every frame, and start narrowing down my selects. I make timeline markers for every B-roll setup, like so-and-so at their desk, product shot, establishing shot. I can zoom out and immediately see I've got a ton of material for this part. Maybe I'm a bit light somewhere else. Then I use a technique I know as pancake editing. I'm not sure who the first person to use this was, and I'm sure there are other names for it, but I learned about it back in 2013 from Vashi Nedomansky. The idea is you have selects on one timeline, and directly beneath you've got the timeline of your edit. Then you go through your B-roll, find the clips you need, and either match frame to get them in your viewer before inserting them in, or if you're more of a kind of mousy click and drag editor, you can just pull them down into your edit. Also, when I've used a clip, I move it up a layer in the selects timeline. Now I can zoom out and see at a glance how much of the B-roll I've used. Have I favored one section more than another? Have I forgotten a section entirely? When you're mixing your audio, I want you to stop spending too much time listening to a track with everything else muted. It can be easy to make a dialogue track sound nice in isolation, but where is it sitting in the mix? Is the music too loud? Not just overall, but maybe you need to carve out some frequencies to make room for the dialogue. 
Maybe that person's voice sounds thin compared to somebody else. You should also be paying attention to the loudness of your video. On the top of the Fairlight page, the loudness meters are measuring LUFS, which stands for loudness units relative to full scale. LUFS is a way to measure how loud audio sounds the human ears, averaged over time. It's measured against the absolute loudest sound a digital system can handle, which is called full scale or digital zero. The LUFS measurement tells you how far below that loudest point your audio is, on average, in a way that matches how we actually hear loudness. Because it's measured down from full scale, LUFS values are always negative numbers, like minus 23 or minus 14. You need to know the specifications for where your video is going to end up and use the meters to see if you're in the right ballpark. This way you know it won't sound too loud or too quiet compared to the other videos it might be played with. This really deserves a video on its own, so if you want me to make it, let me know in the comments. Of course, color is another place you have to think about context. You want to examine each shot and see if you've graded it in a way where you've guided the viewer to look where you want them to. Is there something in the background that's too bright or too saturated that's drawing your attention away from the foreground? If you made a selection with a window, when you play through the shot, does it need to be adjusted or tracked? You also can't grade a shot in a vacuum. You need to see how it looks compared to the shots around it. If you've got several shots from the same scene, do they all have consistent levels of brightness, saturation, white balance, contrast? Now there's lots of ways to do this. You could grab a still of the shot you want to compare it to and double click it to load it in the viewer along with the current shot as an image wipe. You could enable split screen view and choose the shots or group of shots you want to reference by picking an option like selected clips to compare the current clip to a clip you've manually selected, or neighbor clips to compare the current clip to the one immediately before or after it in the timeline, the selected still images to compare a still or multiple stills you have in your gallery. You can employ multiple playheads, and that allows you to quickly switch between different parts of your timeline in the color page viewer. You can go into the keyboard shortcuts and then assign a keystroke to each one and then be jumping around the video in no time. The lightbox view displays a grid of all the clips in the timeline. This is great for quickly getting an overview for the whole video. Or you can filter the view to only show certain clips by using the pre-built filters or creating your own custom filters. If you've got another method for working in context you want to share with everyone, be sure to leave a comment down below so we can all keep learning together. If you want to learn some more tips and tricks from me, you can start by watching this video right here. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.